everyone. Um, um, it's great to be here. It's actually my first ever Vicon UK, UK so, so I'm super excited. Uh, so, uh, my name is Mary, and I'm, I'm, I'm a senior, senior software developer at Cambridge University, University Library. Library. Uh, the, uh, the team, team I work in, we write and support a lot of different software for the library and also for academic researchers. And one example of what we do is Cambridge Digital Library, which shows off all the rare handwritten manuscripts and other amazing things that Cambridge University looks after on behalf of the world. For example, we have, we have Sir Isaac, Isaac Newton's handwritten notes. notes. I, think I think this one is about tangents. tangents. And we, we also have beautiful medieval, medieval illuminations. And here is a bird doing his walk, which <laughs> you will recognise from my eyes. So please do check it out. There will be a URL at the end. And, and with that plug out of the way, let's, let's move on. on. So, what, what exactly is a code walk? And why should you do code walks with your team? By a code walk, I mean when two or more people sit together and talk through a code base while reading the code on screen. One person leads, and the other person or people follow along and have an opportunity to ask questions. So I want to focus on the kind of code walk that you could do when someone new joins your team or when you need to learn a new code base quickly, which of course could be when someone leaves your team. So there are two goals behind this. Firstly, to try and get new starters up to speed more quickly on a code base, so they settle in easier and can just get on with being more productive. And secondly, for the more junior developers on your team, you can show them how more senior developers behave and think, which helps them level up their programming skills. So I learned to code six years ago, originally in Python, but now I work with all sorts of languages and code bases on a daily basis, and I have to learn new ones all the time. So this talk comes out of my own experience, and I think I'm reasonably unusual in that I have a more senior role now, but I still kind of remember what it was like to be a beginner more or less. I teach Python coding for Cambridge Digital Humanities, and it's also still fresh in my mind how you get from starting out to leveling up. So my inspiration for all this was watching Philip Gore's 10-hour code walk of C Python interpreter, which you can see on YouTube. I watched this and I thought, wow, this is amazing. Why doesn't everyone do these? So by sharing my ideas today, I'm really hoping that you will find code walks really helpful for you and for your team, and it doesn't need to take 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start by being honest. Communication is hard, and in my experience, communication in tech is harder. Your senior staff have a lot of deep knowledge about your code bases, and a lot of hard-won knowledge in general. <coughs> and sometimes it can be really difficult for other people on your team to access this, especially newcomers or more junior developers. It's hard to remember what it was like to be less knowledgeable. So much gets absorbed as you go through your career, it becomes implicit knowledge, stuff that you don't know that you know. It's hard to package it up into digestible chunks. So this is why a structured code walk might be really helpful. So the structure of a code walk is simple but powerful. It's like a well-written article or a conference talk with an hourglass shape. You start with a broad overview. You narrow into some details. And then you finish with a broad recap, putting those details into context. So I'm going to use an example of a Python code base but obviously, this might not be anything like a code base that you work on. So the key is to try and understand the ideas in general and then apply them to what you have to work with specifically. So here is my home Raspberry Pi weather station, of which I'm quite unreasonably proud, and it's never been shown in public before, so there you go. <laughs> now, obviously, this is not your high-performance production environment but it still has all the components that I need to show a code walk. 
So you'll see here I have a number of temperatures for different rooms and for the outside, plus there's a weather forecast on the orange card on the right. So the first thing to explain is how the overall system works and where your code base fits in. And a diagram is good for this, especially if it's quite complicated. So this is how my weather station works. Around the house and garden I have these radio thermometers. Uh, they transmit their temperatures every minute on a particular radio frequency, which is picked up by a software-defined radio <coughs> dongle that's physically plugged into the side, the side of my Raspberry Pi. And a small script publishes these temperatures to an MQTT server or broker. And for those who don't know, MQTT is a lightweight protocol, like HTTP, it's, but it's good for Internet of Things, and it works on a published subscribe model where you publish information to a particular topic, and then anyone who's interested in that information can subscribe to those topics. <coughs> so then finally I have a front-end Flask app that subscribes to the temperatures from the server and displays them in a web browser. And the weather forecast, incidentally, comes from an internet weather API, and it's not on this diagram. So I'm going to look at the MQTT client library that I use for the publish step, which is in the red speech bubble. That's the step there. It's a well-known library. It's Paho MQTT Python. Of course, I didn't write it, but it's a great example. So uh, yes, and this is what I use to publish the temperatures. So here it is on GitHub. Now the first thing to do is to describe the directory structure and what all the parts do, even if you think it should be obvious. Remember, you are trying to communicate what is inside your head, so be explicit and don't miss anything out. It also serves as a good warm-up for you to get your brain into explain out loud mode. So I'm just going to play this little video. Um, for example, the first directory is examples, and in here are a lot of example scripts of how to use the library. There's quite a few of these. But this isn't the code of the actual library, let's be clear. This is in source slash paho, and then mqtt, and here are the four Python files that actually make up the code of the actual library, and we will be looking at client.py a bit later. So the next thing to do is to explain about any files related to build tools and dependency management and tests and all that stuff. Trust me, these can be a source of significant confusion. This is the list from um, MQTT Paho. Make file. What is this file? What does it do? Do I need to understand this file to understand how the library works? To use the library? It doesn't even seem to be in Python. Don't assume that your audience knows what this stuff is, okay? In fact, use it as an opportunity to question your assumptions and open yourself up to questions. So, if you're thinking to yourself, I'm assuming you know what make is, say out loud any questions on this make file. So be sure to run through also what you use for dependency management. And here's the requirements.txt. We use pip because it's standard. Or, we made the decision to use poetry, even though it's new, because... Dot, dot, dot. And here's everything else you should explain about. So, finally, explain what can safely be ignored, and in which context. For example, you don't need any of these files to install the library or understand how the code works. This is really important. Experienced developers can look at a code base and instantly know what to ignore. If you're less experienced or unfamiliar with particular tools, it's really hard to know this, and the detail can be quite overwhelming. What you're trying to do throughout the code walk is modeling the behavior of developers who are more experienced, either with this code base or more experienced in general. A more senior developer can look at or read a code base, spend some time with it, have a coffee, and then they're ready to go. But, spot the difference. There is nothing about the way you stare at a computer screen that shows how you're thinking. You have to literally demonstrate the skills and thought processes that you are required to level up in programming skills. So, this is our broad overview so far. Diagram the system context, talk through the directory structure, 
explain files related to build tools and so on, and explain what can be ignored. Okay, so let's dive into some code. First, find a place to start, an entry point. Now what you choose here obviously depends on whether your code is a library, a command line tool, or a web app, or whatever. But one good way to start is with the code that calls your code, or if it's a web app, an HTTP request. Try to start with what would be typical usage first, and cover more unusual cases later on. So in this case, it's my Python script that publishes the temperatures, I've simplified it here for our purposes. So first I'm importing the MQTT library on the first line. And then I'm creating a client instance, and then connecting that client to the MQTT server. And by the way, the names that are in all caps are constants that are defined elsewhere in the script. And then, finally, the script takes a continuous stream of temperature messages from standard in, and publishes each one to a topic on the MQTT server. So there are three interesting entry points, where we create the client, where we connect, and where we publish. So now, we're going to follow the flow of execution, as if we were the computer executing the code. Now, obviously, we're very short on time today, so I'll only be able to show you the gist of things. What I've got is some videos of me scrolling through code, and I will talk over them as they run. This is obviously different from if you were running a real code walk when you would have an opportunity to pause, to explain, to take questions, but hopefully you'll get the idea. So, I'm sorry it's so small, I apologise to those who are at the back. So here is the client object, or rather the class, and an instance of which we create to start with. In the dunder init method that initialises it, all the parameters have defaults, so we wouldn't need to specify anything, but in fact we have passed in our own client ID. What would happen if we didn't pass in a client ID? Well, it creates a random one for us, and here is the code for that. So the rest of the dunder init method creates lots of instant members to do with connecting and packets and connecting, reconnecting and so on, and it includes the default MQTT port, which you might recognize is 1883. Now in a real code walk, you may want to talk about these in more detail. So moving on to the connect method, which we call with a server IP or host name. So we're still in the client.py file and we're still with the client class. And we're going to scroll down, scroll, scroll, scroll down to the connect method. Here it is. And here we've provided the required server to connect to as host, and the rest of these have some defaults. And we find that the connect method actually calls another method, connect, async, which is just below. And what this does is check that the arguments supplied are valid, and if not, raises an error. It then sets those validated arguments on the client's instance, and finally sets the state of the client to MQTT CS Connect async, which, well, what is this? A quick search reveals it's one of four possible connection states stored at the top of the file, along with a load of other constants. So, in broad terms, we are now connected, in that we have stored all the information we need to connect inside the client object. But we have not actually made a connection to check it works. And if this was your code base, this is precisely the sort of detail that might be really critical to understand. So, back to our <coughs> entry points. We have one last method to look at. So the point of this library is to make it easy to publish messages to topics on the server that other clients can subscribe to, and then the server will push those messages out to the client without them actually having to actively do anything. So, it seems fair to say then that the code to do with publishing is pretty core to the function of the library, and we're likely to use it again and again. So here, we pass into the publish method, uh, the topic, and the message. So back to a video. So just below the connect async method is in fact, scroll, 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 the publish method. And the topic is required, and our message is the payload, now, note that the default QoS is zero. QoS means quality of service, and a QoS of zero means fire and forget. So the message is sent, and there's no check 
to make sure it's being received by the server. And this is the simplest possible case. So the rest of the top of this method is some more validation, and I'm just going to skip over that. So here is the core code that is called every single time a message is published with the quality of service set to zero. And if you drill down further into the send publish method that gets called, you will find more core code that sends the message to a queue where it's sent as an MQTT packet to the server. Being able to read code like this is a skill that more experienced developers have and it unlocks a really important achievement. Being able to dive into source code of a function you are using or in a library that you want to use is like a superpower and it's one that more senior developers do all of the time. Of course, there are many awesome IDE tools that you have that might help you navigate a code base and I have not used any of these here deliberately. If you're looking for a mental model of the flow of execution, then manually walking through the code as if your brain is the computer, in my opinion, is more effective for communicating. Debuggers and IDE tools are for other, perhaps more solitary times. Remember, the skills you develop as you level up as a programmer become implicit and automatic, and it's hard to remember something that you've forgotten that you know. And another area where this really holds true is being able to look at code and know whether it's standard, special, or weird. It's not magic, it's just experience. But it's hard-won experience, and I say let's make it a bit easier. So as you go through the code walk, be sure to point out what is standard, special, or weird. And realise that standard, or special, or weird can come at any point in the code walk. So for example, standard can mean from the standard Python library. It can also mean so commonly used it's practically a standard. And it can mean standard Flask app like this directory structure. So point it out. Special can mean we hand-rolled our own implementation of this new algorithm, or I had to write a decorator to modify the caching decorator, like here in my Flask app. Intermediate language features like, the, like decorators can be a significant source of confusion. So do try and spend a little extra time on these. So here the decorator in blue is written specially for the application, but the caching decorator it wraps is the standard one supplied <coughs> with the Flask caching library. Weird can mean we have to interface with some legacy code written in Rex, or the developer did something odd and left the cryptic <laughs> <laughs> So here's a recap on all of that. Find the entry point, flow of execution, what's core code, and point out standard, special, or weird. Finally, at the end of the code walk, you should return back to the structure and the architecture and show where the details you have covered fit in overall. So in this case, let's remember that the client library allows us to connect to the MQTT server and publish the temperature information to it. And the significance of this is that the Flask app then subscribes to these temperature topics and displays the temperatures on screen. So here's my last summary. If your team still has some energy left, you could discuss other things like areas for improvement or <coughs> how to get started with development on this code base. But I would say these are probably optional and might be better another time. So, wrapping up. A structured code walk is a bit like having some pegs to hang your knowledge off indigestible chunks. One peg is the overall structure, one peg is what to ignore, and so on and so on. And as we go through a code wall, if you make sure you have something in each of your knowledge pegs, at the end you have hopefully covered everything. So here's a suggestion. Have someone senior or more familiar with a code base do a code walk when someone new joins your team. Maybe have everyone sit in on it at first so they can learn how to do code walks too. And then, when someone new joins your team, have the last new person do the code walk. I call this see one, do one. And I think this sort of thing could be a great way to develop your team as well as your software. So if you give it a try, please let me know. I would be really pleased to hear from you. And thank you for listening.
you very much. Uh, Murray's not going to be taking questions, but she's going to be more than happy to talk to you all throughout Python. Um, and we're going to just do a switch before our speaker and the next talk starts at 12.30. Thank you.